we got a big press day in the GBRS performance program. We're going to start by getting the spine moving, getting the scaps moving, loading that movement. And then we're going to get into some incline pressing, some vertical pressing, and then challenge that horizontal press, and then transition to some core movements, getting our heart rate up with some sled pushes. Let's jump in this. Everybody loves the press. <laughs> I waited all week for this. <laughs> So we're gonna start from this split stand setup here. DJ's in this half kneeling setup. I kind of like this because it locks our pelvis into position. And then from there, challenge that movement of the scap. So he's gonna do that with a band. If you're not quite there yet to progress with a band, you could do this without. But from here, he's just thinking knuckles into the ground, toes down into the ground, nice and tight. And from here, rigid, just rotating up to the ceiling. Controlling that movement up. On the back side, we're stacking the shoulders, letting that scap reach and rotate, pushing through the floor, pushing up to the ceiling. He's got strong wrists as he reaches up to the ceiling. So not only are we getting T-spine rotation, are we getting scapulas to move, but we're loading that rotation with the band, keeping our hips in this setup. I kind of like this, man. Yeah, and for a lot of guys, you start out with this. There's no ego involved in this. Obviously, the closer your hands get together, the harder the band tension is. But I've seen a lot of guys that are they're like trying to throw body English into it. If you can't get in one clean pull, it's like you're drawing a bow. It's kind of what I imagine. Mm. It's like how much even, even pressure you're going to have throughout this entire motion. Am I in control? Can I stop? Can I feather the motion? I've got the entire thing. I can hold it here for as long as I need to. Then I'm bringing it back though. Yeah. Do without the band for a second. So I get it. I'm the mobility guy. I like movement. But it gets to a point where DJ can do this T-spine rotation for this kneeling setup as much as possible, but we need to load that tissue. We need to elicit a high enough input so that we can get some sort of different output. So that's where that band comes into play because now we're loading that same movement that he just did body weight if we needed to regress it without a band and then being able to progress the same movement with the accommodated resistance of the band. Rotating up to the ceiling, stacking the shoulders, stacking the scaps, nice slow control movement throughout. Eyes track the hands as he rotates up to the ceiling. Muddy. This next movement, DJ has been a huge advocate of our pike to push-ups, but I really like this toe tap reach. From here, we kind of get that single pike hold position overhead, letting the scaps move, getting that upward movement of the scaps around the rib cage, really trying to challenge that joint in that area. But plus, we get a little bit of posterior stretch as you're getting back, getting that dynamic movement, loading back into the calves, loading back to the hamstrings. I really like this one. DJ can open up his feet a little bit more to get a little bit wider as he reaches back, getting that rotation of that spine. We just loaded it with that T-spine rotation with the band. So now getting that through this single arm, pike, toe tap style push-up, I think there's a lot of value with this movement. I always like it more if I slow it down. Like in those transitional points, I don't have both hands on the ground. If I can slow down for the reach, I feel a lot more pressure on my shoulders, a lot more connective tissue, just engaging. Do, do you feel when you were pressing through the floor, being able to like reach and get yeah. that upward movement back Feels side? Better. Yeah, the rear delt, that scout stretch. Perfect. The end. Yeah. Perfect. Next, we got a bottoms up carry with a kettlebell. I really like this for challenging the rotator cuff with an open chain movement. We started out with those closed chain movements, having our hand fixated on the ground. So now we're going to challenge the stability with something like this kettlebell upside down press. He's going to lock it in. Start with one arm at a time, obviously. Goal here is to be an active participant with our core. I don't want him extending at the spine to hold this position. And from here, he's just kind of holding this 90 degree setup and we're gonna walk with this. Nice slow carry, trying to stay stable, as rigid as he can with that shoulder joint, trying to balance that position. He has a little bit of wrist strengthening going on because he's having to balance that upside down position. And he's staying symmetrical as he walks, equal feet between his left and his right. Now let's switch hands. What do you feel on this one? Trying to lock my cord and try to find the balance. A lot of the, the kettlebell wants to roll over my wrist, so I've got to keep it vertical. I think about my knuckles to the ceiling the entire time, just trying to find that balance point. If I cheat it too much and I throw my shoulder out the side, I can feel it start to get away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of like rotator cuff pressure. I'm like, I'm going to try to find that equidistant where I can keep it in balance I'm still strong throughout. Cool. Good. Let me know if you feel a difference left versus right here. We're looking at him trying to stay symmetrical or square to the ground with his shoulders. He's not balancing as he steps with his left first, left foot versus right foot. And he's just trying to stay as balanced as poss possible, as symmetrical as possible. And he's just smooth across the floor, really challenging that rotator cuff with every step he takes. He's having to balance that impulse and be able to absorb that force. Notice any difference between left versus right? I'm more connected on my right, but I feel more guarded on it. I feel strong with my left, but not as in control. Is it like almost 
subconscious, like you're overdriving with one side because you're more hyper aware? I am. I, I feel like my left side is stronger, but I'm not as aware with it. At the hyper mobility and the, the wrist, like all the connective tissue, like I'm doing it, but it's like trying, trying to throw a left hand. In. <laughs> I can do it, but it doesn't feel natural. Yeah. I'm just trying to find the stability. Interesting. So next we got an incline dumbbell chest press. We just came out of a big horizontal bench pressing, a block of our training. DJ actually put up 407. It was a big day for us. So now we're just trying to take our foot off the gas with that horizontal pressing so much. Get a little bit more of a stability factor with putting more emphasis on the dumbbells. I really like the incline chest press for dumbbells. I think it really allows us to focus on our pecs. Really try to challenge that from a strength standpoint. Obviously get some hypertrophy as well because who doesn't want a big chest? Everyone needs a big chest. Everyone needs a big chest. I see, for nothing else, I, I tell the guys, like, bench press isn't the easiest to translate into functionality, but I'll tell you what, it, for young men especially, it builds so much confidence in them. Presence. It just does. Like, when a dude walks in, you bench 315, everybody in the room knows it. Like, well, he can't just wake up and do that. It's like for guys struggling to try to find confidence, gym's the easiest way to do it, man. A absolutely. I remember the very first time you unrack 135. You remember when you unracked 225 and you were like, holy shit, I did it. Yeah. 315, it's the same thing. It's like a milestone in a young dude's life, gym related. You got to do it. I can't, remember, I can't remember what strength coach I heard a long time ago, but they said when you do it 10 times, you own it. Ooh. And I was like, man, that's a cool way of looking at that. When you do it 10 times, that's mine. I own that. And, you, and then you can never take that away from me. Like you did 407 a couple weeks ago. Like whether you do it again or not, you did it. Probably you can do a certain set of ten. <laughs> you don't. You don't own it yet. It's just least. I read that thing. <laughs> um, least three fifteen. Yeah. When we were talking, I mean, don't even need to do. We don't even need to cut this fuck. We're just swinging this thing. <laughs> but uh, DJ mentioned one time starting the dumbbell as far close to the knee as possible to give you more leverage to mount that thing up. And I think that's a secret that most people don't talk about. Yeah, dude. Like, I mean, huffing out hundred dumbbells is. Not an easy thing to do when you're first learning, but I used to drop them all the way high up on my hip flexor, like right to here. And the only way to get them back is essentially do a curl or you fall in this weird ass compromised position and then you don't want to let it go. So if you don't get it, now you're trying to gently set this thing on the ground yeah. and it puts your pec in the worst position ever. Yep. So for me, my cheat code is just above my kneecap. I get them right there and you'll see me like, I'll kind of bounce them in a position when I throw them, I'll throw them one at a time as I go back. I'll basically drop yep. them in the position I need to. Good. On you. Up. Spread, squeeze, stretch, squeeze, squeeze. Don't just think up and down on these reps. We're thinking squeeze. Let's get three more. Squeeze. Good change of direction. Last one. Smooth, change of direction up, squeeze. Money. All right, we got a landmine kneeling press. I think this is a great addition to some of that movements we did earlier with the pike push up, reaching back to our toe, getting that movement of the scapula. Now I really like this for loading that tissue a little bit more, adding some weight from this kneeling setup here, making it more of a vertical press. I love this movement. I'm just from a mobility aspect, getting the scap to move around the rib cage. Set on up. Neely? Yep. Big thing here with this setup is DJ's making sure he has his pelvis underneath him, almost that posterior pelvic tilt, squeezing this right glute. That's where he's getting that force from, driving the right glute, driving up overhead. He's bringing his bicep towards his ear. He's not bringing his ear towards his bicep, trying to stay as symmetrical as possible, bringing that arm up and around, letting that scat move around the rib cage, controlling that downward movement as we load back down. If you don't lock in that red glute, the entire movement changes. Absolutely. If you if you are not an actual participant in every aspect of that, the whole thing gets weird and you can feel it. You're like, why is this so unnatural? Locking your glute, boom. And as soon as you do, your pelvis squares it. It's not that hard now. I noticed it too, if I take this knee and I drive it out a little bit, I can create a little bit of torque and I can lock in this glute. I feel like it gives me a little more stability. I get my whole foot on the ground, because if not, if I'm not an active participant, I just go my red glute, this whole thing will start to move. If I apply a little bit of downward pressure, I can really drive my foot in the ground. Now nothing moves. I mean, for me, I feel super stable like that. Isn't it weird that now that you've, you've learned just work training, how to connect the dots with everything, that when you don't have everything connected, it's like something's way off. It is. And it's so noticeable. What is it? I'm like, what would Vernon say to me right now? 
whole foot on the ground. <laughs> Apply a little bit of pressure, like, oh, this is all day now. Yeah. I mean, like, feel 50% stronger, yep. literally, from just connecting the dots. This is something we prioritize heavily when DJ was having those shoulder issues because it allows us to press vertical overhead, but then a lever point that he can kind of lean into it, he can kind of expose himself to more of a vertical presence on his own, whereas if maybe when we're just starting out, he's kind of pressing away, and then we start to ease in a little bit more as you start to get a little bit more confident, and now we're back into dumbbells, pressing 100 pounds over weight, but definitely something like this is a good starter point is a regression. Yeah, especially with lighter weights all the way over here, because that was my thing, like, I feel like I had no, no flexibility in my lat. Everything was really bound up. I was so guarded. And now I can lean my body into it. I don't have to worry about the, the weight losing and blowing me in a compromising position. But now I can get a full range of motion, a full stretch. Load it and go. Load it and go. Yeah, it's a great. Hell yeah. So now we got a big compounding circuit. So we're going to go with a horizontal press, a lot heavier, something like a bench press. And then we're going to go to a push-up, less weight, more reps, so we're 10, 15. And then we're going to go to a tricep push-down. We're going to use a band setup. Logistically, it makes sense. More people we have in the gym. So 10, 15, 20. But this brings up a good talking point because when it comes to the program, people will say often, hey, what do I do if I don't have that? Stop thinking exercise and start thinking pattern. So a bench press is just a horizontal pattern of pressing. If you don't have a bench press, you can go with a weighted push-up. Or like DJ said, he, he's like, hey, man, we prioritize, prioritize bench pressing so much. Can we get into more dumbbell pressing? So for him, we were going to go stick with the dumbbells going from the incline to the flat. Whereas Davis, I had him benching with a bench press and myself and Manny. So it's just what fits your need and where are you at? What do you have access to? You're in a hotel. I don't have a bench press. You got dumbbells, you got a bench, you got a floor that you could put plates on your back so you can load that horizontal press. Start thinking shapes, not exercises. I mean, for the dumbbells, for me, I can, I can make subtle little grip changes to accommodate my shoulder injuries. Like with the normal barbell, I can't. So I have to put on a slingshot, but I mean, I huff with the 120s, we thump the 135s on them because I can 10 to 15 degree articulation, just wrist positions. I can do a full range of motion. I can pause. My shoulder's not in pain at all, and I need a full press. We did dumbbells two weeks ago. I was so sore yeah. when we got done because I slowed everything way down. We started talking to Chris Bumstead, the mind-muscle connection, full range of motion, let it stretch, feel the muscle fiber rip, and then fire it, squeeze throughout. Bro, I woke up the next day. I was like, I'm a believer. Like, let's take a break on that for a little bit. Let's get some, get some dumbbell patterns back in, and then we'll start to incorporate it. But for me, I just we were on the road for so long for that 407 yep. bench, and it's like, well, now we were there. Let's get back to it. Yep. We're good. Let's get into it. Remember what we're training for. We train to train the next week, to train the next week, to train every day. So our programming, obviously we want to still increase performance, increase longevity, be able to stay in the game, but we can't chase everything at once. So now our chest focus is a little bit more on the hypertrophy side, got um, some strength, but our primary focus is those big pulls from the ground that we're going to get into with this next block. Let's roll it on back. The only difference I do on this for my setup, not that it matters to anybody, but instead of putting them all the way on my knees now and kicking them all the way over, I actually have them kind of high on my hips. And when I fall back, I drop them into a position, but I take my hips with me. That's so as I'm leaning it back, I've got it here. And then when I kick it, it goes into position. I can hold it. That's a great cue. All right, let's lock this in. Spread and squeeze. Like DJ said, we're not thinking up and down. We're thinking intent here, too. Thinking about getting that big stretch, squeezing. He's driving his knees out, squeezing his glutes, slight curve of his lower back off that bench, creating stability, scaps down and back, squeeze. Spread it apart, squeeze. Let's get two more. Money. From there, we're going to go immediately into the other horizontal pattern, which we're going to do for a push-up. So we got 10 reps there. Now we're going to go down into 15 push-ups. If you're having wrist issues, this is an opportunity that you could probably put your hands up on some plates, maybe put it around a dumbbell on the ground so you're not getting so much wrist movement. But DJ's locked in. We've been working on his wrist mobility. Abs tight, good extension of the toes, heads in a straight line. We're in this neutral position, and he's just thinking same concept, up and down, but he's getting the squeeze, the stretch. We're not just thinking about pounding reps out. You're not in boot camp. We're thinking good stretch, good squeeze, good stretch, good squeeze. Yeah, you notice the difference, man. Like, I can crank out a set of 80 push-ups pretty easy without much effort. If I do 20 full contraction, I'm smoked. Yeah, totally different. Yeah, the intent, everything. And then immediately go into 20 of our banded press downs. 
So we're kind of short on our rest period with this compounding scent, really trying to induce some fatigue. We had our bigger movements that were a little bit more complex that we had more rest, but now we're gonna kind of roll right into these. He's thinking about keeping his elbows back by his side, finishing his knuckles down by his side, finishing that whole range of motion. Keep that tension on the triceps, DJ. Keep that tension, go. This is a brand new band and I didn't tell DJ, so this is a little bit more difficult. Lock it down, lock it down. Short rest periods with that compounding set, we're compounding stress on the body, but now we'll take a nice long rest. We're in that two to three minute window, bring everything back to normal. We do everything off of an RPE scale, so the rate of perceived exertion. So how, when people say like, well, how long should I rest? Well, scientifically we might be in that two to four rep window, but honestly, you know your body. You know when you need to take a little bit longer. Maybe you had a lot of stress on the job, whatever it may be. Um, stress in life. So if you need to take a longer rest period so you can repeat a good effort, do so. You're only going to press once a week, so let's make the most of it. Well said. I mean, get to press once a week, so if I need an extra 60 seconds or two minutes, I'm like, who cares? Yeah, I mean, because the RP thing, I get it, but a lot of it's like, I feel good, man. I'm going the whole way. It's like, I need an extra two minutes. I'm going 100%. Let's go. Yep. Yeah. I need to rest, take it. Next, we got the plank kettlebell saw. So DJ's gonna go grab a kettlebell. We're gonna use a 50 pound kettlebell here. He needs that amount of resistance, but I love this from an anti-rotational setup. He's gonna kind of grab this kettlebell and set up in that plank, DJ. From here, he's got a good base with his feet, kind of trying to create as much symmetry as possible so he's not donating mobility, reaching side to side. And from here, he's just gonna vertically press and pull, staying square to the ground. His hips are square to the ground. Shoulders are square to the ground, really reaching out pulling back in. He can speed it up if he wants. He can slow it down if he wants, but just make sure we're not biasing, compensating. Make sure we're equally pushing that right pocket down to the ground and we're not allowing his body to tilt to the left because he's doing this with the right arm. Mike. My opposite forearm, having that in a 45 degree position, vice 90. Yeah. A game change because if not, if I drop it over to 90, I think I can't get a clean pull in there on the kettlebell because you're going off to the side yep and then i have to counter so my arm have to be farther away because i feel like my entire body leans over the one side so we do it at 45 off the kettlebell like i can use this to brace but i feel like even on this i can hold it pretty level yeah what are you cueing to keep your hips square i know i say that but what are you internally <laughs> thinking i imagine a plank or a rod going through both my hips i'm trying to balance it so as i go to saw i'm like a little sense. left pressure, a little right pressure right there. Don't move it. Don't move it. Do you feel the weight shifting in your feet? Yeah. I sometimes when I'm doing it, I'm driving my hips so much that I almost feel like my opposite foot is going to come off the ground. Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. Next, we got a plate sit up. I like this setup when it comes to spinal flexion. It's something that we often say, oh, we don't want to do that. We don't want to challenge spine. Yes, we do. We want to be strong there. We want to be durable. That's a trainable attribute. And I like this movement for this, pairing it with that kettlebell saw really challenging that anti-rotational flexion extension of the torso. This is a great movement for that. So he's going to use a plate. He's going to start with his legs kind of wide to give him a little bit of a base. And he's just going to lurch back. So he's going to reach, 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 thinking slow and controlled. And from there, reach, reach, reach up to the ceiling, thinking get as vertical as overhead as possible. Controlling that movement, then reaching straight up to the ceiling. Is this an ab exercise, an abdominal exercise, an approach to training the trunk? Sure, but really we're looking at challenging the spine. Loading it down, reaching up. Like, What are you thinking about? Controlling the weight the entire time now. Not letting my back smack the floor. Accept, accept the weight, control it. Rebound, but not using momentum. I'm trying to generate from my hips. Sometimes if I lose it, if I dig my heels in, you can feel my hamstring fire up a little bit, and that's stability to get it up. Instead of creating the momentum like a big pendulum, slow press all the way through. Lower, lower, lower. And a lot of this is keeping pressure on your core. Dig your heels in, pressure, 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 redirect. Yeah, that's great. DJ mentioned a key word there, momentum. I think that's a big thing with experienced lifters and people that can use it is that's a tool. 
oftentimes when you're not highly trained, you kind of rely on it. Oh, I can't get this weight up. Let me jerk it, create some momentum and go, which is a place when we're getting powerful movements, challenging plyometrics. But when you can use that as a tool to, I don't want to use it. I want to be able to control it. Now, when I want to relinquish this, now I can let it go because I've harnessed that capability of that training aspect. I think some of the times I've been hurt the worst is when I use momentum to get it done. Hmm. Ego came into it and I was like, I just got to get it up. We can't control it. What are you really doing? Yeah. So many muscles are firing, relaxing, contracting, and just everything. It's like just so much having your central nervous system. I think if you just drop the weight and slow it down to control it, you're so much better out of it. Me personally. It's that whole concept of the weight you may be lifting may be lower, but your ceiling for growth is so much higher because you're controlling it now. So maybe you have to take some weight off the bar, but over time you'll be able to put much more weight on the bar because you're building it up from a better base. So after our press day, we've definitely been prioritizing sled work. We have access to some turf here, so it's been a big push. If you don't have access to a sled, we've been asking people to do lunge patterns. Just think about lunging for a long period of time, but trying to combine some strength to that capacity work. I can't get this guy away from doing chest exercises. So I saw him over here on the press and this is a version that he's been doing, just adding some horizontal pressing to the leg pattern that was already doing. And honestly, I've been doing it myself, I love it. Yeah, I mean, you still get the lower body after you, but for me, for a lot of it, when I have one leg off the ground, I'm only relying on my upper body to do it. And if I can do it slow and controlled all the way through, then I can combine the best of both worlds. Yeah. Right? Yeah, sometimes like, when you really lean into it, like I'm, I'm never really in a position, even with dumbbells, where I'm that low into it outside of a dip. But when I roll it over with that much weight, sometimes it does puts me in a compromised position. But I feel like this, I can, I have more room. Yeah, I'm more in experiment with different movement patterns. All right, let's get these. Just nice slow pace. He's on the balls of his feet. If you just see, he's just combining a horizontal press with it. Just keeping that momentum moving forward. He's just a slight wrinkle. We've already pressed today, so this is about added volume on the chest, but just kind of moving throughout, keeping that tension. So that's a full push day on the GBRS Performance Program. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Make sure to check out the sets, the reps, experiment on your own. If you're looking for more, definitely check out the program. There's a free seven day trial that you get to get just that free access to it, see if you like it, maybe even learn something, maybe you don't continue with it. But if you learn something, that's good for us. Honestly, tomorrow we got core rotation, probably one of my favorite days. Um, so we'll see you guys on that. See you tomorrow.